G'day, I'm Steve. G'day, Steve here, welcome back to the shed. Now it's part two of a two-part series of how to make a knife block. Hand tools. What I'll do is grab the number four blade, uh, number four plane, sorry, with the blade that's just got the corners knocked off. A couple of squirts of water. And importantly, if you remember, we got this out of one piece of wood and all the grain goes the same way. So if you're gonna make one of these, uh, out of different species or mixed timbers, it's fine, but it's always a good practice to get into to make sure the grain is all running the same way. And then whether you're machining it or you're planing it by hand, you're not gonna get tear out. Well, it's gonna eliminate a lot of tear out. I won't say you won't get it because if you've got a cranky bit of timber in there, you could well get a little bit of tear out. Now I've got a very fine cut on this, nothing too drastic. What I'm going to do now, because I'm a little bit undecided how I'm going to finish this, I'm just going to put candle on the front of the sole that's up near the knob. Now the reason for that is if I choose to put an oil or a spray finish on this knife block, if I've got grease on the back of the sole, as I plane, that's going to actually leave a grease or a waxy residue on the timber. So when it comes to finishing, it won't take. But if you only put the wax on the front of the sole, what happens when the blade shears off, you're actually taking that wax coating off. And you can hear that's taking quite nicely. I have got some ridges here where it didn't quite line up. So when I go over those, you'll hear the plane doing hit and miss. When we get a nice smooth sound the whole time, then we know we've got it flat. Just a little glue line there. And they're nice shavings. You could make them a little bit finer, but in this situation, that's fine. Now, it's in the vise. The grain's running this way, away from me. So in order for me to continue to plane with the grain, I take it out of the vise and switch it that way. That way the grain is still running. If I go that way, you'll find that the grain is the reverse to me and I'm actually planing uphill, which we don't want. So from there, we spin it that way, put it in the vise, lock it up, and there are the ridges that we have to plane out, just there. So again, bending at the knees, we're just leaning forward, and you can hear the hit and miss of the plane. And if you're playing like this, with a minimum of effort from your arms, you can plane for hours. Now don't get me wrong, I love machines. Got a shed full of them. I like power tools. But can you imagine doing this at three o'clock in the morning? With a hand plane you can, so if you can't sleep you can come down the shed and do a little bit of woodwork. And then you go to bed tired, which is a bonus. It's interesting, when you've just got a little bit, I've only got a, a fraction of a millimetre or a fraction of a 128th of an inch if you like, to go here and people see that it's only a little bit, oh that won't take long. What they have to remember is you're not just taking that little bit out. What you've got to do is bring the whole surface down to that level. So, you know, it takes a little bit longer than you first think. So we're almost there. Okay. The next bit to concentrate on is the sloping top, which is all end grain. And this bit at the back 
and then we're leaving the base out. Now this is a block plane. That mouth can open and close. I want it fairly tight. You can put it in the vise any way you like. I'm going to put mine in at 45 degrees. That way, when I'm planing, I'm planing on the horizontal plane. Whereas if I put it in the vise like that, I'd have to be planing at 45 degrees. When you start, you most likely think you're not taking anything off. But believe me, you are. So don't give in to the temptation of hanging more blade out because then you're going to start tearing your grain. Now you can see here the change in colour of the timber. That means we're starting to plane all that face and this part we haven't touched yet. So when we get it all like that, you know your plane is actually cutting the timber and it's cutting it flat and the timber itself is flat. Not necessarily at 90 degrees, that's something you have to keep on checking using a square. But to start with, get it all down to where you're planing the timber. If you notice I'm going from one side to the other and back again. And that's going to prevent me from just planing on one side and ending up with a lopsided block. And you can see how nicely those end grain patterns are starting to show up. And how lovely it is when it comes out of one piece of timber. Okay, now you can see with the light on it, obviously this has been planed. We haven't touched this bit yet. Here comes the acid test. Just see how that is. Tell you what, it's not bad. Now also, if you put a square along the front, that line is nice and square to the sides. Now what we've got to do is plane this part off here, and then we'll do the bottom. In order to do the top, I don't want to get tear out on this corner, which will happen if I push the plane right across. So to prevent that, what you do is you put just a very small little arras on the edge. So if you like, that's how the knife block looks now. And when you put a plane over that, it's going to actually pull these fibers out. But if you put an arras on it, the plane goes over and doesn't tear the end fibers. And when we finish it, we're going to round over the corners anyway. So a little bit of a chamfer here really doesn't make any difference. And here we go. The back's starting to look good too. It wasn't until very recently I actually discovered there is a right way and a wrong way to do end grain. And it's true, in this case, I'm actually planing against the end grain and it's causing a little bit of chatter. So what I'll do is spin it around and I'll just give it a couple of passes with the end grain. And if you don't believe me, get a bit of timber on the end grain with a sharp block plate and you'll find one way will give you a beautiful finish and the other way won't. Here we go. Okay. That's lovely. Make sure it's square. Yep, that's good there. We know that's good there. A little bit on the ridge here. Only a smidgen. I reckon three passes each way. And there you have it, nice and square. Now we do the same to the bottom. Got it in the vise. Start at the high point first, which is up the back here. And we could get tear out, so we put a little bit of a chamfer on both sides, I think. Done. Now for the acid test, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. Put it on the bench, doesn't wobble, that's pretty good. 
Okay. Now what I think I'll do is run the plane over the face and the back, just to get these dirty marks off. Again, grain direction. And the back. Again, swing it over in the vise like that. So that means the grain direction is still going away from me. I guess most of you have picked up I'm left-handed. If you're right-handed, you'd most likely be working this way on the bench. Same rule applies. Pick it up, swivel it 180 degrees, and you'll always have your grain direction running the right way, providing you start it out running the right way. And there we have one knife block that has been hand planed, but it's still very sharp on the corners. So what we can do is you can put it over the router and router the edges, whether you put a, um, a round over on it or a mitre on it, whatever. You could knock it off with sandpaper and just take the arises off. Or if you want to still persevere with the hand tools, let's go with a spoke shave. The thing I like about spoke shaves is you can pull them towards you, they work fine. You can push away from you, they work equally as good. Now you can do a nice fashionable round over. Just a little gentle one if you like. For those of you who think you've got to have special uh, spoke shapes like mine, you don't. I'm just as happy using a regular auction buy um, spoke shave. As I've said before, I, I like H&T Gordon stuff. They're made in Australia. Uh, this is a, a record 51. Works just as well. Stanley's work equally is good. And you're getting these nice twirly shavings off it. And then when you've got it in the vise, you can also do up the sides. Because we already put a chamfer on there, so might as well have another chamfer all the way around. Just be careful on this little back part here. So maybe on the corners you come back so you don't get chip out on the corner there. Same on the other side. And along the back. So now I'm going to sand this off. You can take that straight off the plane blade and believe me to feel that that is smooth enough. But we'll go through the process. Okay. Just go around those circles. I'm using 100 grit at the moment. And you don't go across the grain, go up and down. Now on the edges. Around the corner, across the back. Down there. And I'll do a little bit of a roll over here so that line isn't quite as sharp. And one up here. So what we're actually doing with softening, instead of being very angular, we're just softening the lines a little bit. Now, if you've got an orbital sander, random orbital sander, as usual, by all means, use that. But if you don't, sandpaper's a go. I think I'm using 150 now. Okay. Got 180. And I don't know if you've seen this before. It's been on my tips, tricks, and techniques videos. But if you want to extend the life of your sandpaper, a lot of people, if they're going to fold it into four, they fold it in half and in half again. These two surfaces rub together, so effectively, you're only using half a piece of sandpaper. But if you rip down, so in other words, fold it into four, then rip down one area, fold it, fold it, fold it, then all this sandpaper is actually just on the backing paper, and it doubles the life of your sandpaper. Uh, this is nearly done. 
The other thing is to double check to make sure this steel hole here is nice and square. Sometimes it'll move when you glue it up and then all you've got to do is get a chisel, half inch chisel, and where the timber's sitting proud, in this case I got it right, but where it's not aligned, if you get a half inch chisel, just poke it down there and then just pare it down on both sides because if it's poking in on this side it means it's going to be poking in on the diagonal so because it's two different bits of wood. Clean it up like that, turn it over, clean that up like that. The other thing I love doing now especially with things that I make on the show and what have you is I put a brand on it and we'll just put it right about there I reckon. And there we go. Then we'll put the finish on, that's going to pop out. Speaking of finishes, let's put the finish on. Let me move this first before I burn myself. A bit in there, there we go. And that makes the brand really stand out. And you watch the grain. Isn't that absolutely brilliant? You will notice when you're putting the grain, the oil on, that the, the top is going to absorb a lot because it's end grain. So, you know, you mostly have to give it several coats over time. But I'll tell you what, before I go, there was an incredible, absolutely incredible amount of interest over the safety goggles and glasses that I wore when I started this project. These. So, for all that are interested, they're actually called eye muffs. They were designed in Australia and I was speaking to the guy who designed them, his name's George, and he sent me up a box of all different bits and pieces, and they're just phenomenal. Look at that. You've got, they're actually mesh goggles. So if you're um, using a chainsaw, you've got mesh goggles, and they don't fog up like normal goggles do. There are lenses, um, what are they, anti-glare. There are dark lenses, or you can get to go with it little LED lights, I don't know if you can see that, but little LED lights, so if you're working in a dark place, you've got your goggles on, you've got a little light, so you can actually see what you're doing. They're absolutely brilliant, and to change them, to change lenses, it's just a question of clicking one side on, clicking on a new lens. I mean, that's brilliant. Anyway, <coughs> that's his website down there. If you're interested, I must. They really are good, and uh, that's all the plug you're getting. Anyway, back to the knife blocks. I'm going to go and get the knives, and I'll be back with you shortly. All of them, and even this big meat cleaver, fits nicely in there. Now, if you can remember, I did make a mistake, or um, changed my mind, as I like to think, and there was meant to be three holes here, for knife blocks and I said doesn't matter we'll make a steak knife block well true to my word exactly the same process that you used before and there is a knife block for steak knives so it's the same system only you make one inch cuts or whatever width your uh, steak knives happen to be this one's cut at a block angle to match this and just for a bit of decoration I put some um, pinstripes in it. So try it. Use all hand tools if you like or use machines by all means. It really doesn't matter but it's a great little project to have at the end. They're good for gifts. Christmas coming up you can never prepare too early for that and uh, have fun with it. If you use different coloured timbers they look good as well. So that's it. Steve pulling the shed door down on another project and saying remember to keep it sharp but more importantly keep it safe and enjoy your woodwork and like us on Facebook. There's the address. Thanks a lot. Bye for now.